Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Thursday, November 17th. And tonight, we're talking about what's next for Democrats. For me, the hours come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus. The top three Democrats in the U.S. House are all stepping down from their leadership positions. Why are they moving on and who will succeed them? A former spokesperson for House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer joins us next. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Karen Bass just won the mayor's race in Los Angeles. She will be the first woman in that role. We'll have more on the politics of Southern California just ahead. Also tonight, paralyzing snow is on the way. Michigan and northern Ohio could get up to 10 inches of it. Buffalo, New York could get four feet. We'll have the forecast. And Red Cup Day at Starbucks is turning into the Red Cup Rebellion. More than 2,000 workers went on strike. What are their demands and how is the company responding? One of the union organizers in Buffalo joins us live. Today, an era ended on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced that she will step down as Democratic leader. With great confidence in our caucus, I will not seek re-election to Democratic leadership in the next Congress. For me, the hours come for a new generation to lead the Democratic caucus that I so deeply respect. A new day is dawning on the horizon and I look forward, always forward, to the unfolding story of our nation. Speaker Pelosi oversaw a number of major legislative achievements, including the Affordable Care Act. She has embodied Democratic leadership for the past 20 years, and she is the first woman to lead her party in either chamber of Congress. Now, to be clear, Nancy Pelosi is not leaving Congress. She's just leading the, leaving the party leadership. NBC News projects that Republicans will take control of the House in January. When that happens, she'll still be a member representing San Francisco. Soon after her speech this afternoon, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer and Majority Whip Jim Clyburn also announced they were stepping down. Again, not from Congress, just from leadership. They are the number two and number three House Democrats. Joining us now is Marielle Saez, Senior Vice President at the political consulting firm SKDK. She previously served as the Biden administration's Director of Broadcast Media and as Deputy Communications Director for House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. Ms. Saez, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. What do you make of Speaker Pelosi's decision to step down from her leadership role? How does that fit into what her overall legacy will be? Sure. Well, I think President Biden put it best when he said that um, Speaker Pelosi will go down in history as the most consequential speaker. Um, she has broken down barriers um, and just delivered transformative change um, throughout um, the decades of her service. Um, the entire leadership team, uh, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Hoyer, Whip Clyburn together have been incredibly effective. Um, and I know that they um, believe strongly in um, the institution of the House and are very proud of the diversity of the caucus. So, you know, it seems that both Speaker Pelosi and, and Leader Hoyer have determined that the way they want to serve moving forward is by ensuring that next generation of leadership in the caucus uh, are supported and and, um, you know, uh, have steady uh, guidance and counsel as they move on to the next Congress, where they're sure to face some really challenging uh, circumstances. I do want to talk about that next generation of leadership in just a second. But set the stage for us in terms of what this current leadership step down means between Speaker Pelosi, uh, Leader Hoyer, and Whip Clyburn. First of all, I think we're all kind of familiar with the House Speaker. The party leader and the whip that's a little more inside Washington. Explain for us what those jobs are. What do the majority leader and the majority whip do? 
That's right. Um, it is a little inside baseball, but um, for this, for us, uh, you know, Capitol Hill nerds, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, so the majority leader is responsible for scheduling the House floor. So they work closely with the committee chairs to determine which, and the speaker, of course, um, to determine which bills are going to come to the floor, ensure that they're ready for um, for prime time, uh, that they have the votes, um, and uh, consider you know how the uh, the mechanics of how they're going to come to the floor, whether they're going to be passed on a bipartisan basis or whether we're looking at a partisan uh, 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 party line vote. Uh, so uh, very closely um, working with the members to get their bills on the floor and advance legislation through the House. Uh, and the whip is uh, works very closely um, with the leader to ensure that the Democrats have the votes in the minority. Um, they play a critical role in ensuring that um, that the Democratic Party could keep their caucus unified against Republican attacks on President Obama's agenda at the time. In the majority, they were working very closely with the with the White House, with the other leaders, to ensure that their votes to um, get these transformational bills that we've seen passed um, through through the House. So very important roles. Um, and as I said, they're a very effective team. The three um, leaders that are uh, transitioning roles. I wonder how you see just the three of them in terms of their decisions to step back from leadership roles. And again, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that they are leaving Congress. They're just stepping down from these leadership roles. They'll still be members. They're duly elected. But in terms right. of just them as people, it occurs to me that in the last few years, they've seen and been through a lot. I mean, whether it was just the fights between Democrats and Republicans during the Trump administration, COVID and the fights over that, January 6th. You know, the, the ascension of Joe Biden as president, which Jim Clyburn was pivotal in. I think Joe Biden owes his presidency in some ways to Jim Clyburn in South Carolina, and especially the attack on Paul Pelosi in San Francisco. Just as people, I kind of wonder how this moment affects them in the middle of all the turmoil and history we've been seeing. I mean, if, if I was Nancy Pelosi and my husband had just been attacked in our home in what may be a political attack, I might be ready to step back too. Well, look, as I said, more than anything, these leaders really believe in the institution of the House and defending our democracy and delivering for the American people. And I think that's what you've seen throughout their career that will continue to go on and be part of their legacy. Um, and they can continue to serve this House with the expertise that they have in shepherding transformative legislation um, through Congress and um, defending against um, the attacks that we saw um, throughout the Trump presidency. and. Um, what we're seeing Republicans gear up in the House with their investigation. So um, they bring uh, just incredible expertise and um, experience to um, the caucus. And, and they, you're right, they will continue to serve, continue to serve their constituents, and also continue to serve the caucus with their um, with their guidance, with their strong expertise, and um, and the just historic moments they've been through um, over the course of their, their careers. And I, I know they'll continue to build on, on that legacy moving forward. I appreciate you mentioning the experience and the expertise, because I think that's going to be one of the narratives that will play out in terms of who succeeds them. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat from New York, spoke today uh, praising Speaker Pelosi, but was a little evasive in terms of a question from a report about whether he might want to jump into one of these leadership roles. Here is part of what he said. Watch. It's been an honor to be able to serve in leadership with Speaker Pelosi, Leader Hoyer, and Whip Clyburn, and to learn from them, to see what happens as we move forward. When do you plan to announce your intentions? Now is the moment for us to continue to celebrate speaking. So he's a little evasive on that, but his name is among those that has been batted around as a contender for minority leader. Congresswoman Catherine Clark of Massachusetts is one of the names that's been mentioned for minority whip. She's currently assistant speaker. And Congressman Pete Aguilar from California, who is currently the vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus, has been bandied around as a possible caucus chair. Talk about how that transition occurs from old guard to new guard. What sort of dynamics can we expect there? 
Sure. Well, just as you saw um, earlier this week with Republican leadership having um, being elected, um, the Democrats will have their leadership elections and the caucus will choose who will serve in those three roles moving forward. Um, yes, you're right. They have not quite announced their runs yet. Um, today was um, a day for the speaker and the leader to um, inform the, the country and the caucus of their next steps. But, um, you know, should they decide to announce that they will um, take on, um, be asked the caucus for their support, um, then they'll go to the leadership elections and the caucus will um, will vote and decide. Um, if they are chosen, um, I have no doubt they'll, can, they'll they will be wonderful leaders. They are all talented, smart, well respected by the caucus, um, and um, have had some experience already in leadership. Um, serving along with the speaker, Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Clyburn. For now, Mariel Saez, I appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Senate candidates in Georgia are campaigning hard ahead of their runoff. It's just over two weeks away on December 6th. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican Herschel Walker both held events today. And clearly, they both know that razor thin margins can make all the difference. NBC Shaquille Brewster has more. Less than three weeks until Election Day here in Georgia, and the intensity on the ground is really picking up. Herschel Walker out on the stump this evening after we saw Raphael Warnock have three events throughout the state earlier today. And his messaging is shifting a little bit. We're hearing him plead urgency for his supporters, telling them it is important for them to come out and stay involved in this runoff election. And we're also hearing him sharpen and tailor his attacks against his opponent, saying that his opponent doesn't have the competency or the character to be elected senator. I want you to listen to some of those attacks that we heard. You actually have to do homework. You actually have to be curious. Herschel Walker doesn't know the issues. He doesn't, isn't that obvious? He doesn't even know the issues. And what's worse is he's not interested. And then there's a battle on the TV airwaves. Raphael Warnock out with a new ad targeting Republican voters, specifically people who voted for Brian Kemp in the general election. And then Herschel Walker's campaign out with a new ad personalizing him, trying to soften his image, talk about him as a, someone who has small town values, who likes to give back and serve his community. New ads, bus tours, you really get the sense that we are getting closer and closer to that election day as more people are paying attention to that runoff election. Back to you. You do indeed. Thank you, Shaq. That's NBC Shaquille Brewster reporting on the Georgia Senate race. The mayor-elect of Los Angeles is preparing to lead America's second largest city. NBC News is projecting that Democratic Congresswoman Karen Bass will win that race. Her opponent, real estate developer Rick Caruso, has conceded. Mr. Caruso was a registered Republican, but switched parties for this election. He spent about $100 million of his own money on this campaign. Today, Mayor-elect Bass laid out her priorities. Our City of Angels was founded 241 years ago. And for 128 of those years, since 1894, the evil of Los Angeles has been dedicated to uplifting the women of this city. And so it is with a special feeling in my heart and with the thoughts of my mother and my daughters and all of the women in this city that I stand before you in this place as the next mayor of Los Angeles. <laughs> Karen Bass began her career as a community organizer. She became the first black woman to lead the California State Assembly back in 2008. Now she will be L.A.'s first female mayor and its second black mayor. Tom Bradley was the first. In his concession statement, Mr. Caruso wrote, quote, As a city, we need to unite around mayor-elect Bass and give her the support she needs to tackle the many issues we face. Congratulations, Karen, and Godspeed, unquote. Let's get into this race with reporter Julia Wick of the L.A. Times. She covered the mayoral election. Ms. Wick, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. What does it mean to Angelinos to have Karen Bass as the mayor versus Rick Caruso as the mayor? Who did each of those campaigns seem to appeal to the most? 
It's a great question. Um, I think the biggest divide was party lines. This was a really hard election for Caruso to win as a former Republican in a city that is just overwhelmingly Democratic. Um, and Bass had really, really strong leads with people who identified as liberal, very liberal, registered Democrats. Um, she did better with white and black voters. Caruso put an enormous, enormous amount of effort into a field campaign meant to uh, turn out primarily Asian and Latino voters who had historically been less likely to vote. And, you know, I think we still, we still don't have final numbers on demographics, but it's not looking like there was a huge difference in turnout in LA city versus statewide for those demographics. So I think that $16 million field campaign wasn't necessarily as successful as they had hoped. Let's get into what some of the mayor-elect's priorities are going to be. Here is a little bit more from her victory speech today where she laid out some of the many issues that she's going to have to tackle. Watch. We are going to solve homelessness. We are going to prevent and respond urgently to crime. And Los Angeles will no longer be unaffordable for working families. Good jobs. Good jobs and affordable housing are on the way. So homelessness, crime, affordability for working families. I don't know about you. I'd say that those are issues at least one, two, and three for Angelinos these days. And homelessness Absolutely. has been the, the, the focus of some furious protests in the last few months. What's she going to do to address these giant issues? So she has said her very first step on day one will be declaring a state of emergency on homelessness, which, by the way, pretty much all of the candidates said they would do. And that allows for you know, some other levers of power once that emergency is declared. She put out a platform that relied on a nine point plan, which largely kind of leans into speeding up and expanding existing programs. Um, her plan was a bit smaller in scale than Caruso's, but some people argued more realistic. Homelessness is just such a massive, massive issue in LA. It's so visible wherever you go in the city, upwards of 41,000 people sleep on our streets or in temporary housing every night. And so it's not something where there's any quick fix. I think that's not just going to be the focus of her first year, but arguably her entire four-year term. What about affordability? I know, you know, California is a more expensive state to live in than many other states in the union. I lived in San Francisco for six years, so I can definitely relate to the affordability issue. But I'm not sure how much power she will have as the mayor versus, say, the city council or the L.A. County Board of Supervisors or the governor of California to actually impact affordability within just her office. What levers does she get to pull with regard to affordability? So L.A. is a relatively weak mayor system. The council, which is a 15-member body, which is very tiny for a city as big as L.A., holds much more power. Um, but the mayor has a really big bully pulpit in L.A., so she can certainly advocate for solutions. She can advocate for streamlining processes, making it easier to build affordable housing in L.A., because in L.A. and California more generally, it's incredibly hard and cumbersome to build. Um, and the other thing the mayor can do is they appoint all of the commissions and department heads. So there's, you know, city um, planning, all of these different things. There's quite a lot of power in this kind of less glamorous arena of appointment. I wonder how the election of Karen Bass to be mayor fits into a lot of the other political stories around L.A. I mean, you've got uh, Kenneth Mejia, the first Asian-American elected to citywide office in L.A. to be the city controller. You have the scandals in L.A. County with regard to the sheriff's office. Alex Villanueva will, is being defeated in that race. Then the scandals at City Hall with those recordings of members of the L.A. City Council making wildly racist remarks about the child of one of their fellow members and the fallout from all of that. Angelinos have got to be a little tired of all of the political crazy, but very eager to see things move forward. How does Karen Bass's election fit into the rest of all of that? That's a fantastic question. Um, and I would say people in LA are definitely very tired and also feel pretty disenchanted with local government in general. I break it up in a couple of different sections. Uh, one narrative that her election is very much part of as the city's first woman mayor 
is a wider, really big shift in gender leadership in the city. Five years ago, there were two women on city council, and that's two out of 15, and no women holding citywide office. Um, coming in December, there will be, oh shoot, one race got decided, um, either five or six women on city council and two women in citywide office. So that's a massive shift. Our board of supervisors, which has historically been overwhelmingly male, even prior to this election, was all female. So we've seen just over the last decade to five years, kind of LA's power structure remake itself from being much, much more male to women having a much larger seat at the table. The other overriding narrative, which Bass somewhat fits into, but um, is indicative of a real leftward shift in the city. Uh, two, in this year, in both June and November, two uh, progressive challengers who are quite a bit to the left of Bass, uh, backed by the DSA and other grassroots uh, left-wing organizations, defeated incumbents in city council. So they will both take office in December. And then, of course, Mejia's win. And this is, I think, one of the most interesting stories in LA politics. The city controller is the chief auditor and accountant for the city. And it's a job where if I were to walk out of my house and go, you know, stand in the street and ask people, hey, do you know what the controller does and who the city controller right. is? I don't think very many people would be able to answer me. Um, and Kenneth Mejia managed to make this one of the sexiest and most followed races in LA, the cycle. He, he ran a really unconventional campaign. He harnessed the power of social media. He used a lot of kind of unconventional tactics. You know, at one point he dressed up in a Pikachu costume. Right, he right. was all over TikTok. He brought his corgis with him everywhere and they were on all his campaign materials to really generate interest in this position while talking about very serious issues. And so it's not often that you see those two things kind of paired together, at least not often that you see it done so effectively. Um, and he won. Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I, I, I wish I had more time to talk about Kenneth Mejia, because clearly he is an interesting race that's worth circling back on. But perhaps we should have you back on to talk more about him. But for now, LA Times reporter Julia Wick, these are indeed fascinating races. I appreciate the context, and I appreciate you making time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Up next, we will turn to a developing story at Twitter, a new wave of resignations. Many employees appear to be saying goodbye after Elon Musk's ultimatum. Plus, a complete failure of corporate controls. That is what the new CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX is saying about the company. We'll look at the unusual business practices like approving payments with emojis. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. We're following developments tonight out of Twitter. The deadline has now passed for employees to decide if they want to work there under Elon Musk. The new CEO told those who did not share his vision or were not willing to work intense hours to leave. The deadline was today at 5 p.m. Eastern, and employees were offered three months of severance. NBC technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now with more. And Jake, depending on what you're watching on social, it looks like a number of people at least are tweeting that they're out and that they have made no secret of their desire not to work under these new conditions. But what more are you hearing? Well, Joshua, at this hour, really, what is not happening at Twitter? Uh, we, as you mentioned, a few hours ago, were looking at this deadline, this ultimatum that Elon Musk had put in front of his staff, essentially saying, click here to commit to extreme, hardcore working conditions. And it was not spelled out in an internal FAQ document exactly how that might change, for instance, the benefits you would have, only that you would be working harder, possibly working weekends. Uh, the, the ultimatum that he put in front of people seemed to have been intended to sort of weed out the people who weren't adequately committed. Well, supposedly at this hour, not enough people have uh, clicked that committal button to basically keep the place running. What we are hearing from internal engineers is that critical teams, teams charged with the infrastructure that keeps Twitter going. And again, this is not just some company. This is the way that world leaders speak to each other. This is the way uh, that, that police get evacuation orders out, right? That site is in danger of going
going down because some of the critical teams in, t in charge of infrastructure are there, are, are supposedly walking right out of that place. Here's another important thing to understand at this hour, uh, Joshua, is that right now, as we understand it, an internal email went out to everyone. It's been shared with our colleagues at CNBC saying we are shutting down the offices. So the big Twitter HQ, the iconic building, is locked out as of this hour until Monday. Not clear why that might be, but certainly the paranoia we have seen from Elon Musk over the last few uh, days seems to have been reflected in the order to shut people out of that building. So tremendous resignations. The ultimatum does not seem to have gone the way he intended it to. And at this hour, that building is empty, Joshua. So this is a lot of upheaval in a very short period of time. And for people who don't know San Francisco, that building was the source of a lot of political unrest because Twitter got tax breaks from a previous mayoral administration, including to keep it there on Mid-Market Street in a more or less beleaguered part of downtown San Francisco at the time. So there's a lot of unrest going on at Twitter right now. But, Jake, just a little bit of context. We have heard from people in other parts of tech, especially, say, the video game industry, where grinding on software is normal, right? Where it is expected as part of the culture that you're going to work crazy long hours, you'll get paid well, you'll get great benefits, but it's just de rigueur. It's just sort of the way that things are done. This feels different, though. This feels like it's a cultural shift that people didn't accept when they got there, but now they're being forced to accept to stay there. Do I have that kind of right? I think you absolutely do. I think we're looking here at a big shift. And, you know, I can absolutely understand to somebody looking in from the outside, looking at this and saying, how can these people be complaining? They're some of the best paid, most valuable employees in the world, right? And uh, the complaints that we have seen in recent days that Elon Musk and his team are scouring the tweets of employees to make sure they are not disparaging their former employer. You know, that is weird for a guy who claims to be a free speech absolutist, but it is absolutely normal in corporate America right? Uh, you know, uh, we at any company are required to not disparage that company publicly. So all of that, I understand. What we're also seeing, however, is a big shift from what was really an article of faith in working at Twitter. You were there as part of a piece of big, important civic infrastructure. You were theoretically trying to keep people together. We're talking about the instrument by which world leaders who have no other diplomatic channel to speak to one another get the word out to one another in uh, across Twitter, right? It is an extraordinary channel in terms of what it does, and it is largely unique in this landscape at this moment. I think that the bargain that people who were working there really made with themselves was we're going to go and work as hard as we can on this place in order, but because we believe in it. Then Elon Musk comes in and begins talking about how he wants to blow all of that up. He, of course, throws right. away the verification system, which could prove that anyone was who said they say they wanted to be, and wound up not only alienating big advertisers who got impersonated by various paying jokesters and wound up not only losing stock value but then pulling out of the advertising they had placed on Twitter but he was also by doing that according to the people we've been speaking to inside endangering what makes Twitter valuable which is again yeah. this piece of important civic infrastructure that people were communicating across now I was a big critic of Twitter we've all been a big tw critic of Twitter but the people that agreed that it needed to be improved a lot of those people seem to be walking out the door at this hour, and that is part of what's so concerning here, Joshua. I do want to note that just in the time we have been talking, Elon Musk tweeted again. He tweeted, how do you make a small fortune in social media? Start out with a large one. That does not sound optimistic. We will see what happens out of Twitter in the days to come. Thank you, Jake. That's NBC technology correspondent Jake Ward. And we had meant to talk to Jake a little bit more about something that you will be seeing later tonight in an NBC News special. Hellscape goes inside the meltdowns both at Twitter and at the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. Stick around for that report. It's tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. Still to come, we'll have more on those missile strikes in Ukraine. The latest on the war and new details on the deadly strike in Poland just ahead. Russia is keeping up its missile strikes on Ukraine. Lately, its strategy seems to be destroying power infrastructure. Today's strikes also hit residential buildings around Zaporizhia. The office of Ukraine's president says those attacks killed four people. 
Meanwhile, Ukraine and its NATO allies seem to disagree over that explosion in Poland on Tuesday. Poland and NATO are suggesting that a Ukrainian air defense missile caused the blast. They say it was not intentional and it was not a deliberate attack from Russia. And U.S. officials are agreeing with that theory. But Ukraine's President Zelensky says they can't conclude that until after a full investigation. And he says a team of Ukrainian specialists will join Poland's investigation. NBC foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has more from Kyiv. In the last 48 hours, there has been quite a lot of daylight between what we've been hearing from the Ukrainians, from President Zelensky, from the foreign minister, uh, Dmitry Kaleba here, and from the Polish uh, leaders from NATO and from President Biden and from the U.S. Secretary of Defense. But this is a conflict that the Ukrainian government does not want right now. Clearly, President Zelensky got a little bit ahead of himself, certainly before the investigation, certainly out ahead of the Polish leadership on Tuesday, right after that missile explosion. And then yesterday, Yesterday afternoon, he really came out strong again, saying it was not our missile. It was not our missile strike. By last night, though, there was a subtle shift in his language. He no longer claimed that it was a Russian missile. missile excuse me. He no longer claimed uh, that it was not a Ukrainian missile. Clearly, I think the sense is that he's looking for an off ramp. What we do know, though, today is, according to the foreign minister, that Ukrainian investigators are now in Poland. Um, they have requested access to the site. They expect to be granted access to the site as part of a joint investigation. Investigation. And Secretary of State Blinken has said that President Zelensky has personally spoken, as you would expect, with the Polish president who has shared that evidence. So I think, I assume that gap between what the Ukrainians have been saying publicly in the last 48 hours and what the international community and really what the Western consensus has been, that is going to narrow uh, in the next day or two. What both sides, and they're not really on both sides, but what both uh, parties really agree on, of course, and what the international uh, community has been very clear on, what the Americans have been very clear clear on is that even though it was a Ukrainian missile by their evidence, they certainly hold Russia accountable, that Russia is to blame morally. And Russia is to blame for the fact that 50 percent of the capital is without power. Russia is to blame for the fact that there are missiles flying over this country and that Russia is to blame for the fact that now 10 million households, that's not even people, uh, are looking at about two to three hours of electricity every single day uh, as these days here uh, in Ukraine get a lot colder. That was NBC's Molly Hunter reporting from Kyiv. There's another development in Ukraine to tell you about, and it goes back to a moment that clued us into Russia's invasion back in 2014. Today, a Dutch court sentenced three men to life in prison for shooting down a passenger jet. The plane was flying over part of eastern Ukraine that was controlled by separatists. It had 298 souls aboard. The flight was going from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur when a surface-to-air missile hit it. This happened soon after Russia had annexed Crimea. Ukrainian President Zelensky tweeted that today's verdict was important and that, quote, punishment for all Russian Federation atrocities then and now is inevitable, unquote. However, the three convicted men, they're still at large. Who knows if they will ever serve those sentences? NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more on the verdict. The Ukrainian government is welcoming emphatically a decision by a Dutch court sentencing three men, two Russians and a pro-Russian Ukrainian, although in absentia, to life in prison for their, for their involvement in shooting down a passenger plane over Ukraine in 2014. At the time, Russia had just seized Crimea. It had seized portions of eastern Ukraine and pro-Russian militias operating with Russian military advisors apparently believed they were firing on a Ukrainian military aircraft, according to investigations by Dutch authorities, and it turned out to be a passenger plane, and the passengers and their luggage came raining down from the sky, and for a lar there was a large debris field in eastern Ukraine, one of the most horrific scenes in recent memory. The Ukrainians say that Russia deserves to be condemned for this incident. Russia consistently denied any involvement. In fact, it said at the 
the time that this was all a conspiracy, that there was no way that Russian uh, weapons could have been involved and that Russian personnel were involved in any way, uh, even though Dutch authorities later uh, turned up phone intercepts, they did forensic analysis of the weapons involved, and, and uh, conclusively decided that it was the work of pro-Russian militias operating with, uh, with Russian military advisors. Uh, Ukraine says Russia needs to be condemned for what happened then and needs to be condemned for what is happening now because Russia is continuing to attack this country. Uh, just in the last 24 hours, there's been another barrage of airstrikes targeting Ukraine's infrastructure. And according to Ukrainian officials, at least seven people were killed. That was NBC's Richard Engel reporting from Mykolaiv in southern Ukraine. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including a snowstorm that could dump feet of snow near the Great Lakes, the efforts to fight domestic terrorism on social media, and testimony about the Trump Organization from its former chief financial officer. Tonight's headlines begin with a historic lake effect snowstorm. Heavy snow has begun to hit the Great Lakes region. Upstate New York's bracing for it tonight. These lake effect snowfalls happen when Arctic air hits the Great Lakes every fall. As climate change warms the planet, it warms the lakes too, and that means more evaporation in the atmosphere during the winter and more of this lake effect snow. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens has the forecast. Hey, Bill. Joshua, they're throwing a lot of big words around, paralyzing, crippling, you know, like state of emergency. It's hard to explain lake effect snow to people that have never been in it because it's not like a regular snowstorm. It's more like being in the way of a snow gun if you're on a ski mountain. It's like a narrow stream of very heavy snow. It sometimes can only be 10 to 15 miles wide, but if you're right underneath it, I mean, it could just be devastating and crippling and plows can't even keep up. So that's what the possibility is. That's why you're hearing so much about this event that's starting now and will continue until we get through the weekend, especially maybe not even ending until Sunday. So there's about 6 million people that are under certain alerts. We have snow coming off all of the lakes. None of them are frozen yet. They're all pretty warm. Cold air over the warm lakes is always going to give us lake effect snow. So areas in Michigan, coming off of Lake Michigan, have snow off of Lake Superior, Lake Huron. But the heaviest snow bands will be coming off of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. This is Ontario. This is Erie here. And this is the areas that will get the feed of snow because we're going to be under that heavy hose of snow for a long period of time because the wind direction is just going to be right. So we're already starting to see signs of this snow band forming over the top of Lake Erie. Again, you know, it could hit one in town and give it two feet, and the town below it may only get a couple inches. That's what we deal with when we have lake effect snow events. And all indications are the way that the orientation of this heavy band is setting up, and notice right here by my finger, that's a lightning strike. So we're already getting what we call thunder snow. So you, uh, it's almost like in the summertime with a thunderstorm, but instead of rain, you're getting snow. And you can imagine how heavy the snow would be. That's how you get feet of snow in these events. So this heavy band is now starting to head towards Buffalo, and it's going to be over the top of the city all night long. And it's easy to do the math. If we get 10 hours of 2 to 3 inches per hour, you're going to wake up with about 1 to 2 feet at least tomorrow morning from Buffalo and the, all the snow towns just south of Buffalo, where Rochester is only expecting 1 to 2 inches out of this, where Buffalo could get 4 to 5 feet. That's just how these events work. So the highest totals are obviously shown here in Pink, that's 18 inches plus here from Buffalo southwards down to Erie, also off of Lake Ontario. Not really Syracuse this time, really Oswego northwards up to Watertown. But this area in here, 48 to 60 inches of snow. That's up to five feet. Last time we had an event like this was 2014, and we did have one location get 65 inches of snow. We had people stuck on the highways. They had a National Guard had to go rescue them. We had roof collapses because the weight of all that snow on the roof. So in the middle of this thing, people are going to be out there with rakes getting the snow off their roofs because of all the heavy snow and the weight of it. So here's the timing of everything. So let's take this into tonight. This yellow shows you where that heavy band of snow is. Again, look how narrow it is, but right near Orchard Park. And then tonight it's going to sit here and waver near this area, Buffalo southwards. By 8 a.m. Friday, it looks like the band's going to head to the south a little bit. Hopefully we'll get a break in downtown Buffalo and they'll start to clear the roads. But then as a Friday night goes, the band comes right back at them. So there's going to be periods of this, Joshua, that are going to continue over the next couple of days. Again, it's a wall of snow and you don't want to be in it it's going to be ugly most definitely not thank you bill that's nbc meteorologist bill karens with the forecast 
A new Senate report accuses social media giants and some law enforcement agencies of not fighting extremism hard enough, specifically domestic terrorism, white supremacists, and anti-government extremists. This comes from a lengthy report by the Senate Homeland Security Committee. It alleges that the FBI and Homeland Security could do more to address growing threats. A statement from the FBI says that it is agile and adjusts resources to meet the latest threats. DHS said that, quote, addressing domestic violent extremism is a top priority, end quote. The report also calls out the business models of Meta, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube for allegedly incentivizing extreme content. A TikTok spokesperson told NBC News, quote, we believe that maintaining a safe and trusted platform is critical to our long-term success, which is why we are dedicated to identifying and removing content that incites or glorifies violence or promotes violent extremist organizations, unquote. A Meta spokesperson directed us to their Community Standards Enforcement Report. Among other things, it describes the kinds of content the company removes before they get reported. A YouTube spokeswoman said the platform is acting to block extremist content. Twitter has yet to comment. Today, the former CFO of the Trump Organization testified in a criminal trial about the company. Alan Weisselberg was asked if Mr. Trump or anyone else gave him permission to commit tax fraud. He said no and added that his decision to not pay taxes benefited just himself. It was, quote, my own personal greed that led to this, unquote. NBC investigative correspondent Tom Winter has more. Alan Weisselberg, the Trump chief financial officer, back on the stand today. He's still being paid by the Trump Corporation, expecting, hopefully, he says, a bonus of over half a million dollars sometime next year. And today he said that over the decades that he did the Trump Organization's books, that he did, in fact, with the Trump Organization, with its controller, Jeff McConey, and the Trump Corporation, uh, did carry out a scheme where he defrauded taxpayers in the state of New York and in the city of New York by receiving apartments, luxury rental cars, even tuition for his grandkids, all from the Trump Organization. That wouldn't have been illegal, he testified, but it was illegal when, in fact, he didn't pay the taxes. He was asked on cross-examination by Alan Futterfoss, the Trump attorney, were these charges tied to his personal taxes or the Trump Organization? He repeatedly said this was about his personal taxes. He was also asked, are you embarrassed by what you did? He quietly said, I am. Are you ashamed? He was asked, and he choked up and said, very much so. Alan Weisselberg, back Back on the stand under cross-examination tomorrow morning. That was NBC's Tom Winter reporting. Up next, a strike at Starbucks. Workers from more than 100 stores walked out during one of the chain's busiest days of the year. A union spokesperson joins us before we go. Can't exist on only tips. That was the message from the Seattle Labor Chorus outside of Starbucks there this morning. Similar scenes played out at more than 100 locations today, though not necessarily all with singing. Some employees called it the Red Cup Rebellion. It's a play on Starbucks Red Cup Day. That's a yearly promotion where customers get a reusable cup with any purchase, and it's one of the company's biggest sales days of the year. Frustrated workers use the day to draw attention to their push for union contracts. It's the largest collective action we've seen yet from Starbucks Workers United. That effort began in Buffalo, New York, more than a year ago. Joining us now is Michelle Eisen, a spokesperson for Starbucks Workers United. She's a barista at that first organizing location in Buffalo. Ms. Eisen, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. How did things go today? I know that Buffalo is expecting some horrible weather in the next day or so, but how was the turnout and what was the reaction like? Things went really, really well today. I was able to stand outside my store on Elmwood Avenue, the first in the country to unionize, and we shut the store down. Uh, we demanded that the company stop these unfair labor practices, that they fix the staffing in our stores, and that they come to the bargaining table in a meaningful way so we can start to negotiate this first contract. 
Talk about what's been going on in the immediate run-up to this day, this Red Cup rebellion. Had there been talks with the company that had been going on? What was the, the prelude to all of this like? So the company has used every delay tactic in the book to prevent us from getting to the bargaining table and start hashing out this first collective bargaining agreement. Um, we have, in the last few weeks, been able to get to the table in some form. Um, but again, Starbucks has used that to twist the narrative and, and tell the public that they are actually bargaining these first contracts, when the reality is they're coming to the table because they need to fulfill a legal obligation to do so. But they still have no desire to sit down and actually have conversations with their hourly workers where we can start to solve some of the problems that have been plaguing these cafes for the last several years. What kinds of problems are you referring to? Give us a few examples. Um, today, we focused on short staffing, which has been prevalent in these cafes for a very long time. But on a day like this, a Red Cup day, which is one of the most profitable days for the company, we are always notoriously understaffed on that day. We don't generally have enough product to meet the demand. It's a day that the company wants us to celebrate and they promote in a way that, um, you know, it's the kickoff to the holiday season. But for us baristas, it's one of the worst days of the year, generally. It's a day that you get in there and have to make do with what they're they're giving you and just survive. And that's unacceptable. This is a billion-dollar corporation. They're bringing in billions of dollars off our labor. They can afford to give us a couple of extra bodies on the floor today, of all days. Starbucks put out a statement earlier today. I want to read at least part of what they wrote in the statement. It reads in part, quote, we're aware that union demonstrations are scheduled at a small number of our more than 9,000 U.S. company-owned stores. In those locations where partners choose to participate, we respect their right to engage in lawful protest activity. It goes on to read, quote, counter to what the union has shared, Starbucks has continued to engage Workers United representatives in a good faith effort to move the bargaining process forward. As a result of our efforts, we've shown up to more than 50 bargaining sessions across the country and have another 60 scheduled in the coming weeks, unquote. That is a statement from an executive at Starbucks who deals with labor communications. How would you respond uh, to their statement? I would say as one of those workers who has been at, uh, you know, at a unionized location for almost a year now, if this were actually true, we would be well on our way to signing that completed first contract. Um, instead, what I saw at these 50 sessions that the company is saying that they attended is them coming into a room, sometimes not even long enough to make introductions, and then walking out as soon as they realize that it, with the room full of people that they're there to negotiate with, there's there are sometimes a couple of people joining us via a Zoom platform for accessibility issues, and they use that as an excuse to walk out of the room and not let negotiations get any further. So um, I think that they're twisting that quite a bit. I wonder what your sense is of how far you can get with this. In the interest of full disclosure, I have negotiated union contracts before. I used to be a member of SAG-AFTRA at a previous job. And one of the things I had to learn was about the limits of what we can ask for. We can deal with wages, working conditions, that kind of thing. But there are limits in terms of how much we can control the management of the company. It's the difference between saying we need to be paid well and you need to run the company well. You know, bosses are allowed to be stupid, for lack of a better way to put it. There's only so much you can kind of demand from them. So how optimistic are you in terms of what you can actually get Starbucks to do before they say, hey, you don't get to run the company for us? Well, I think first they've got to allow us to get to the point of making some asks, which we have not gotten to that point yet. But I do think that what I'd like to see is the company recognize that this is the right choice for the workers and for the company, and that nobody knows how to solve these problems in these cafes better than those of us who are on the floors running them every single day. In this case, we were talking about staffing. We have a lot of solutions to these staffing issues, and our voices need to be heard. We decided to unionize so that we would have a voice in our working conditions and in the policies that we have to enact every single day. And now it's their duty to have these conversations with us. So my hope is that we can come together and reach a compromise that the company can be proud of and that the workers can be proud of. I know I got to let you go in a second, but, and I don't want you to negotiate in public, but what's at the top of the list of the things that you want to lay on the table next? If there was one thing 
that if you could just have a meeting about one thing right now, tonight, what would it be before we go? I think we need to have them acknowledge their workers' right to organize. So right to organize is at the top of this list. Right now, we've seen the company, uh, the NLRB is alleging the company has well over 900 violations of U.S. labor law. This is a huge, huge problem. We cannot let billion-dollar companies and billionaires come in and railroad the American labor movement. We can't let them bully their workers into not allowing them to execute their right to organize. So that's at the top of our non-economic proposals is recognizing our right to organize and allowing us to go forward and do that. Michelle Eisen of Starbucks Workers United, please stay safe from the storm coming to Buffalo, and I appreciate you making time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for making time for us. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.